Good afternoon and welcome to the continuation of our virtual roadshows on our new relationship with the EU. Before Christmas, we looked at what manufacturers needed to do in order to be ready to leave the single market and customs union. Now we have a deal, we'll be drilling down into how it affects your business. This first hour long session, looking at the deal itself, will be followed by a series of further events to interrogate the new rules for business travel and movement of people, rules of origin, product labelling and trading with Northern Ireland. Today, Make UK's Fergus McReynolds will be giving a general overview of the deal and the areas which affect Britain's manufacturers the most. He'll be joined by John Harkin, Senior Policy Advisor for CMET, our European counterpart trade body, who will explain how the deal's going down in the EU itself. However, just before we begin, a few quick housekeeping items to note. All attendees for today are in listening mode only and only the panellists videos are visible. If you want to engage with the panellists or to ask a question, please do so by typing your question into the Q&A box in the Zoom control bar at the bottom of your screen. Please don't use the chat because there are so many of you on the call, we're not going to be using that today. Aaron and I will be moderating any questions during a brief Q&A session, um, which will follow the presentations today. Um, finally, today's webinar is being recorded and will be available on the website afterwards and in your follow-up pack. So with no further ado, please let me hand over to Make UK's EU Director, Fergus McReynolds. Thank you, Fergus. Thank you very much, Hilary. And hopefully everyone can see my screen there. As Hilary has said, uh, what I'll be going through today uh, is an overview of what the new deal means for manufacturers. It will look at the various elements that were agreed as part of the trade and um, cooperation agreement, and looking at some of the key things that companies need to be aware of in the new relationship with the EU. This uh, is an introductory to a series of events which will look at in more detail at the more specific and uh, detailed guidance which uh, companies need to uh, prevail themselves of to understand the new relationship. What's important for us to understand is that the UK and the EU have reached a trade and cooperation deal that was signed on the uh, 24th of December uh, and will now go into uh, provisional application, having been agreed by the UK Parliament before the end of the year, uh, but is still to be agreed by the EU Parliament, which my colleague John Harkham will take you through later. While um, the deal does provide uh, for uh, the protection of many of the issues which we wanted to see protected in our future relationship, it is certainly a deal which is better than leaving without a deal. It has, as we have uh, presented over many years, tried to protect the integrity of uh, European supply chains and focused very much on uh, ensuring that trade uh, can continue to flow between the UK and the EU and also um, between Great Britain and Northern Ireland. However, what is important to understand is that it does fundamentally change our relationship with uh, our biggest trading partner and there are a lot of things that businesses need to do now that they weren't doing before the end of last year. What we try to think about uh, in decoding the agreement is understanding that there are a new world of three and what that means is you need to understand that there are different rules if you are supplying goods into Great Britain if you're supplying goods into Northern Ireland, and if you're supplying goods into the European Union. And depending on where you are based and where you are sending those goods from, different requirements will, um, will, will present themselves. It is quite important to stress that, that the relationship, particularly between Great Britain and Northern Ireland has changed, as well as the relationship between Great Britain and the EU. Looking at some of the issues which companies need to ask themselves, really what we need to see is understand where your company is based. Are you in Great Britain? Are you in England, Wales and Scotland? Are you in Northern Ireland? Um, or is your business uh, in the EU? Then understand who you are selling a product to. Are you selling that product in Great Britain? 
Are you selling that in Northern Ireland or are you selling that in the EU? And then look at where you are sourcing your materials from. It's quite important that companies understand those processes because depending on the answers to those questions, you will have a different set of requirements. Just as an example, a business based in South Wales selling to Northern Ireland will have a different set of responsibilities from a business in the southeast of England selling into Germany. And it's important that companies understand that where you are based and where you are selling to will determine the rules that you need to follow uh, in this new relationship. It's also important that you familiarise yourself with the customs and border formalities. A key part of the UK's new relationship, having left the single market and the customs union, is that border formalities will be the norm for trading with the EU. Now, many businesses will have uh, existing experience in this area if they have traded with uh, third countries or countries outside of the EU, but a lot of businesses, as we know, have only uh, traded with the EU, and it's important for us to understand that that relationship has changed and that there are requirements for goods. You need to do in many of uh, the situations uh, and undertake those formalities before the goods leave your site, so it's important to understand those in great detail, but it's important that we understand that there are different requirements for different markets. It's also important to understand that in those three markets, there are different market regulations that companies need to address. So it's not just the border formalities of getting your goods lodged in the customs systems, but it's also understanding your responsibilities in the different markets that you are selling to. Historically, the UK and the EU existed in a single uh, market of regulation. Uh, that is no longer the case, and there are different market requirements for selling goods in Great Britain, different market requirements for selling goods in Northern Ireland, and different market requirements for selling goods in the EU. And you will have to avail yourselves of those differences. What the uh, Trade and Cooperation Agreement does deliver is tariff-free and quota-free access to those three markets. Now, on the face of it, that is true. Any good which is originating in the UK or in the EU should have tariff-free trade between those two markets. But because of the technical details of the agreement, in particular, uh, the issue of rules of origin, which we'll come to in a moment, a lot of the requirements may mean that companies will face a tariff on what is a considered fairly standard business with the EU. So understanding the technical details of the agreement is going to be important. The deal also delivers in terms of the provision of services and provides for mobility, the ability for, for individuals to uh, live and work in different uh, jurisdictions, so across the EU and in the UK. But again, there are a lot of new rules in this area, and it's important for companies to understand their responsibilities, both in terms of the ability to provide a service in either market, but also in terms of business travel and long-term immigration for employees. It's also important to understand that some of the more um, ambitious elements of the trade agreement and trade negotiations, which we had pushed for, such as the mutual recognition of conformity assessment is not provided for in this deal. That means that there will be different market regulations and particularly in the area of marking and labeling that companies need to be aware of. And again, we'll come back to that issue later on in this presentation. So the deal does deliver in terms of tariff-free uh, and quota-free access to both markets but there are a number of different technicalities which means that not all trade will be tariff free and understanding those technicalities is going to be essential for businesses. It does provide for the provision of services but again it's important to understand your responsibilities. It does provide for uh, access for short-term business travel but again with um, requirements for companies and there are a huge range of technical barriers to trade, which companies need to be aware of in terms of supplying into those three different markets. 
but what do you have to do even if you don't pay a tariff? I think this is quite an important element of the new relationship is um, simply because the agreement is a tariff free and quota free relationship, that doesn't mean that there isn't administration to prove that point. And it's important to understand that many of these requirements are necessary when sending goods certainly into the EU, but also into Northern Ireland from Great Britain. So regardless of whether you have to pay a tariff, it's important to understand that you will still have to make a full declaration. Now, while the UK government has provided some easement uh, in terms of a phased introduction of the UK border, that easement is not provided fully on the EU side and many of your responsibilities in terms of docking into the European uh, custom systems meet our requirements from day one. It's also important for you to understand where you source your materials from. Do the products originate in the EU? Do the products originate in the UK? And depending on the answers to those questions, you will be able to determine whether a product can be sold tariff free. As I've said, even though the provision is for tariff free, there is a lot of uh, formalities which companies will need to familiarize themselves in order for products to be able to smoothly move across those borders. And many of those requirements will take place before a product leaves your site. Rules of origin are a large part of the trade and cooperation agreement, as they are a large part of many free trade agreements. It is the rules of origin that really determine whether a product will be supplied tariff free or not. The way that rules of origin work is essentially they set up a system to determine whether a product has originated in either one of the two parties to the agreement. So the UK has its own customs territory, the EU has its own customs territory, and for a product to gain tariff free access, it must be seen as originating either in the EU or in the UK. It's important for companies to understand the product specific element of rules of origin. So for each product that you are supplying, there is a different set of rules of origin, and a different way for calculating that. What's important to understand is that this deal does not provide for any level of diagonal accumulation, um, but it does provide for full bilateral accumulation. What that really means is that companies who are processing components or parts which are sourced either in the UK or the EU as part of their larger product should be able to enjoy tariff-free access into the EU market. However, if you are sourcing material from outside of those two jurisdictions, it's important to understand whether the level of processing will provide you with tariff-free access into those two markets. Essentially, the best way of looking at this is that if you are sourcing material from the UK or the EU, you are putting that into a bigger product and you are then selling that product into the either one of those two markets. It should be tariff free as long as there is sufficient processing. So as long as you've carried out a uh, manufacturing process on that good, it should be that that good is supplied tariff free. If you are sourcing material from third countries, there are several different things that you need to consider. First of all is the level of value of that good or the weight of that good, how much of that uh, component or part goes into the final product that, you're pro that you are producing and then selling on the market. For many products, there is a provision of up to 50% content from outside of the EU and the UK, as long as that, that is processed su sufficiently in either one of those two markets. However, um, what, what it's important to understand is that if you are bringing in product from outside of those two markets and it is not processed, so it is simply brought in, stored in the UK and then sent off to the EU, it is quite likely in that scenario that you would have to pay a tariff on that. If there is insufficient processing and under the trade and cooperation agreement, there is the list of processes which set out what insufficient processing means, means you are likely to have to pay a tariff 
on that product. So what happens in, in that situation? If I'm bringing in something from outside those two markets, how do I assess whether that can qualify? And what do I do if it doesn't qualify? So if I'm bringing in product from outside of the UK or the EU, how do I avoid a tariff being paid on that? Because as it currently stands, one thing that companies need to be aware of is that if you bring something into the UK, you will pay a UK import tariff on that. If you then choose to send that on to the EU without any further processing, you are likely to have to pay an EU import tariff on that. There are special uh, customs procedures which com companies can apply to avoid those. And it's worth companies who are in that situation where they source a large amount of content from outside of those two markets, or they simply bring in content which is insufficiently processed and then supply it to customers in the EU, they can avoid that situation of being tariff, uh, tariff being imposed twice. Um, but it's important to understand that that won't fully alleviate the issue which is facing many companies at the moment. Some of those processes to mitigate against those rules of origin are customs warehousing, customs transit, uh, and inward and outward processing. Customs warehousing essentially allows you to bring a product into the UK and avoid it from being in free circulation. So free circulation means that it is available on the UK market to UK customers and it isn't in a customs warehouse. Transit uh, is a provision under international trade rules that allows you essentially to bring things into uh, one market as it transits into its final destination, its final customer market, or allows you to transit through a customs territory to your final customs territory. Inward and outward processing allow you to bring in a product, process it and send it on. Um, and it's important to understand that all of these procedures may be able to mitigate to some extent some of the uh, exposure to tariffs from rules of origin, but they are not um, overnight fixes. They are processes which must be applied for, and it's important for you to understand your responsibilities in that. These are some of the issues which will be explored in a later session on rules of origin in more detail, but I wanted just to provide you with a highlight of some of the issues that companies need to understand in terms of rules of origin and some of the ways that it's possible to mitigate those. A, a, another part of the trade and cooperation agreement is that the situation in Northern Ireland is governed by the Northern Ireland Protocol. Northern Ireland Protocol was designed to avoid a border on the island of Ireland, but it puts Northern Ireland in a very unique position. Um, products uh, originating in Northern Ireland can freely circulate on the EU market, and because of that provision, it means that there are uh, processes which companies need to undertake to send goods from Great Britain to Northern Ireland. Now, a lot was discussed about this in the run-up to the end of uh, last year, but it's important to understand that there are procedures, there is administration, there are things that companies need to do to send product from Great Britain to Northern Ireland. You need to submit a pre-notification through uh, a, a uh, customs facilitation mechanism uh, known as the Goods Vehicle Movement System, the GVMS. You need to do that in partnership with your hauliers or if you are declaring yourself, you need to understand your responsibilities. Many of the um, pieces of information that you would need for trading with the EU, such as your commodity codes um, and your registration numbers are required uh, to send goods to Northern Ireland. Again, we will have a detailed session on Northern Ireland uh, as part of this series of, uh, uh, of virtual roadshows, but I'd also alert you to a previous uh, workshop um, which we have done uh, in this area. There is a trader support uh, service which the government has set up and companies should, if they have not already done so, look to register with that uh, particularly if they are sending goods from, North, uh, from Great Britain to Northern Ireland. It's also important to understand that you will 
need a separate EORI registration number to access many of those services. So if you already have your GB EORI number, in terms of trading into Northern Ireland and, and uh, having the trader support service, there is an additional uh, EORI number known as an XI uh, EORI number, which is required. So contrary to a lot of uh, discussion, as I said, uh, before the end of the year, there are considerable um, procedures which companies need to undertake uh, to trade into Northern Ireland from Great Britain. I also mentioned uh, at the top of the presentation some of your responsibilities under marking and labelling. What's important here is to understand that there is no uh, mutual recognition of conformity assessment. So where you were uh, testing and certi uh, certifying your goods in the UK for circulation across the whole of the EU market, that is no longer possible. There are different requirements for Great Britain, there are different requirements for Northern Ireland, and there are different requirements for the EU. This is another example where that world of three comes into play. So understanding your responsibilities uh, in those markets is very important. You need to understand the introduction of the new UK conformity assessment mark, the new UK CA mark. And while the government has provided some easement uh, in terms of the application of that from a extension of the recognition of the existing CE mark, through to affixing uh, stickers and accompanying paperwork rather than actually changing the mark. It's important that anyone who continues to want to put a good uh, on the Great Britain market is aware of their responsibilities uh, under the UK conformity assessment mark. It's also important for companies to understand their responsibilities in the EU market. And many of those will have changed from the end of last year into the beginning of this year. And a particular element of that is in terms of the uh, conformity assessment mark, the CE mark on a product. Where you are self-certifying um, for adding a CE mark to your good, you can continue to do so. However, if you are supplying a good that requires a certification from an authorised body, what you will need to ensure is that that authorised body or notified body is in the EU market. You will have to have that undertaken by an EU27 um, competent authority for it to be able to be supplied on the EU market. So it's important for companies to understand that. There are also a number of situations where you are required to have an authorised person or to have uh, contact information on the product you're selling. And it's important again to understand that the UK Great Britain market is separate from the EU market and you are likely to have to have technical documentation, authorised individuals and contact information which is different for those two markets. So again, understanding the responsibilities for both markets. In many cases, unfortunately, this will mean a dual set of requirements and we will be very uh, conscious in following the development of market regulation, both in Great Britain and the EU. From day one, the rules are the same in Great Britain, the UK and in um, the European Union, but it's important to understand that if they uh, start to diverge, there will be different procedures and processes which companies may need to undertake to ensure that the products are eligible for those two, those markets. Another area of change is in terms of business travel. Uh, we will have a session on business travel, which will explore in much more detail the requirements. It will also look at the requirements in terms of immigration into the UK. The UK from the 1st of January is operating a new points-based immigration system, and that will apply to EU nationals as it does to third country nationals. So bringing individuals into the UK to work in your businesses, there is a set of new requirements that companies need to be aware of. But it's also important for companies to understand their responsibilities when sending people into the EU for business purposes. Now, while the deal does provide for some uh, easement in terms of 
visa-free travel for uh, business purposes. And there is a list of activities set out in the trade and cooperation agreement, which should provide you for visa-free, work permit-free and pre-notification free access to the uh, EU market for short-term short -term business travel. It's important to understand that that does not alleviate companies of their responsibilities individually, locally in the market they are going to. So the market uh, labour legislation always applies in the country that you are visiting. So what we are advising companies to do is to check before you go. Um, it will not be as easy to uh, travel to uh, an EU country um, as it was historically. And while the deal does provide for some easements, it's important to understand your individual responsibilities in the individual country you're going to. So sending someone to the Netherlands will be different from sending someone to France and understanding your responsibilities in that market are very important. It's also important to understand that you will uh, have to travel into that country uh, through the queue uh, with the rest of the world. And what that means is that when you uh, enter a European country, you will be challenged by a border officer and asked for what your purpose is in that country. The concept of freedom of movement is therefore uh, gone. You will have to justify why you're entering. And answering the questions which you are asked about the purposes, particularly if you're traveling for business, it's important to understand that you have uh, fulfilled all of your obligations because it may well be that staff will be turned away if they haven't uh, uh, set out the requirements um, before traveling. So what we are saying is check before you go and understand that the rules in every different European country will be slightly different. There is guidance available from the government, but we also have uh, guidance which is specific to individual countries uh, and we will run a session on both European business travel and immigration in more detail in, uh, in, in the weeks to come. One final element in terms of business travel, which is important to understand, is that as of the 1st of January, UK and UK nationals are considered third country nationals um, uh, as far as the European Union is required, as, as, uh, as far as the European Union. Um, and that means that the current restrictions um, brought in because of the COVID um, pandemic mean that there is a limited number of transits or a limited number of movements into a country um, which are deemed essential. So again, uh, it is important for companies to understand and we have already uh, seen instances that individuals who have been traveling have been turned away at the border because the activities were not deemed essential under the COVID requirements. So several things for us to consider in terms of business travel, the most acute at the moment being the restrictions in terms of COVID. I'll, I'll uh, uh, leave it there in terms of the uh, detail of the agreement. I'm very happy to take uh, any questions. Thanks very much. Um, okay, Fergus, so we've um, got one here um, from a company that's based in the UK, which sells into the EU. Now, um, they buy raw casting from Germany, import and machine it in the UK, and then um, sell the machined casting to another company in Germany. That company then includes that into their product and sell it worldwide. So is there a tariff for this company in the UK and are there any issues for the German company with the tariff when they then go on to sell it um, worldwide? Thank you very much, uh, Hilary. It's a bit of a complicated the, one. So no, no, abso no, absolutely. I mean, th th this gets to the absolute heart of the um, importance of understanding the rules of origin and how they apply specifically to the pro product. This it really is at the, at, at the crux of the deal and, and, and important for companies to understand. On the face of it, something which is sourced from Germany comes into the UK, is processed in the UK, and then processed in Germany and sold to a third country out of, outside of Europe. It should be the case 
that only the trade outside of, uh, from Germany to a third country would potentially bring a tariff depending on what country that went to. However, it's important for a company to understand where that product is coming from in, uh, into the German site in the first instance. It's, in, it, it's important then to understand whether it has undergone sufficient processing in Germany for it to be considered as originating then in Germany and therefore coming into the UK being tariff free. The process which is undertaken in the UK would then have to be sufficient for, or for it to then be originating again, but this time from the UK, for it then to um, be tariff free back to Germany. Now there are some uh, processes which you can apply in terms of customs um, processing. So if you didn't have a, a significant transformation, it's possible you might be able to apply for inward processing relief coming into the UK. Um, but uh, it is really about understanding specifically for the product that you are, um, that you are uh, managing, what specifically the rules are and where the content has come from, whether you've uh, processed it sufficiently and where the product is going to. It should be the case that that is tariff free, but it is not a guarantee that that, that would be tariff free. Thank you, Fergus. Uh, another question that's hopefully slightly, slightly more simpler. Um, what happens if you source a fully made product in the EU, import into the UK and then re-export to Ireland, but have done no processing? Do you have to pay duty because you have done no processing? Um, yes, I mean, th 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 this is an issue which has um, uh, dominated the news feeds uh, for, for, for some weeks and I think uh, has been referred to by some as, uh, as, as the issue around um, the Marks and Spencer's um, Percy Pig suites. So something which is produced in Germany uh, comes into the EU. So it is wholly obtained in Germany. It, it, it is German content. So coming into the UK doesn't pay tariff. If that product then enters free circulation, and no further processing takes place with it. It is then exported from the UK to Ireland. Um, under that circumstance, it would be uh, at a tariff rate because there is no processing of that product in the UK. The reason this has come about is that essentially in free trade agreements, there are very standard rules for uh, determining origin. And it is, it is not often the case in a free trade agreement that a company would send a product from one jurisdiction to another jurisdiction without processing it and then sending it back. Now, there are ways that you can try and mitigate some of your exposure to that, um, but many of those require you to have the product not in free circulation. So they would have to be under the authority, the customs authority. So there is warehousing, there are transit mechanisms, there are return mechanisms, but it's important to understand that that product has to stay under the authority of the customs authority in the UK. It can't be in free circulation. So thinking about how you manage that situation in the future, it might be worth considering having separate uh, distribution mechanisms for that, either holding them as separate from the goods that you want to freely circulate in the UK and separately goods which you want to then send to another European country or looking at alternative routing of that product. It, it, it is a, a very unique relationship that the UK has with the EU where product comes in, it doesn't get processed and goes out. And that is essentially the situation. Without any processing, without any customs procedures, under that situation, it would attract a tariff going into Ireland. Thanks, Fergus. I'm going to ask you just one more quick question just now, and there are several have been coming in, quite a few in the chat as well. Um, we will answer these after the event because we're not going to have time to do them just now. So please don't worry, your question will be answered. So just very quickly, Fergus, just now, this is a company that um, is sending machine tools out, from, out for repair, rather, from the UK to the EU. And the question is that you mentioned in, inward processing and outward processing to mitigate duty. Is this something something the company needs to register for with HMRC? I'm assuming yes. Um, yeah, the, 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 the simple answer to that is, is yes. Um, you do need to, um, to register for that. And uh, unfortunately, it isn't an overnight process. 
So, uh, and, and we do understand that there is a, a backlog at the moment with HMRC requests in this area. So it's something that I would advise looking at as soon as possible, um, but it's not something which would be, uh, be, be achievable um, uh, overnight. Um, in, in, in terms of the, the, more, the more detailed uh, session, as I said, we will be having a session on rules of origin, uh, looking at all of these issues. Uh, and all of the issues that you've just talked about there are, are about um, how the rules of origin apply and how they uh, apply to uh, tariff and tariff free access. Lovely, thank you. Thanks very much, Fergus. That's a very detailed explanation of the deal there. Um, and um, we'll hear more, as you say, in the coming um, drill down session.